line them up like this. Like a lasso, right? Hey, you're so fussy, get the Lone Ranger to do it. Boys, boys, please, can it wait? The online's in a week. Oh, yeah, the online, great. The online, yeah. They wouldn't know an online if you bit them. Uh, so we can depend on you then, John? No sweat, babe. Hey, I'm a real light, so if you want some action. <laughs> Lovely, John. Uh, I'll bring the milk, and you can get your mum to bring the biscuits. We've got no choice. No, look, no, I'm not being ratty with you. Come on. Look, I washed my hair this morning, and I can't do a thing with it. <laughs> All right, then, yeah, we'll see you then. OK, thanks. Bye. That's it, we got it. We can do the Trocadero at 10 o'clock. Oh, bleep! We've got to go now. What do you mean, we? Well, I made the contact, so naturally... Wait, 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 you! In front of camera. Yeah. What's the matter? Has the hunchback of Notre Dame got his day off or something? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Lemmy can't make it, can Listen, he? I'm the editor. I made the contact, so I do the shoot. Hang on. Oh, Hello. Pate. Oh, hi. Thanks for calling back. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we wanted to do a piece on Shadowlands. Oh, that Why doesn't he right. get his hair cut? It's so 60s. Just what we need. OK, I'm going to go. Bye. Hey, where are you? Jake, where are they going? Got to do the feature, the truck. Well, I don't know why you're laughing. You're still here. Get on with your space invaders. So they went without me, did they? Off to have a good time at the Trocadero Centre in London's Piccadilly Circus. It's said to be the best arcade in Europe, and they're here to take a closer look at the Virtuality Centre. Have you got crutches? Oh, I'll have this one. Our intrepid reporters are here to test the latest virtual reality arcade game, Heavy Metal. <laughs> We're going to get in. Heavy Metal is an amazing game where up to four players can compete against each other in a full virtual reality environment. A computer city, as you can see here. Controlling gigantic robotic walkers, the aim is to knock the stuffing out of anyone you can find. Wow! What was that about? You may look silly from the outside, but inside the stereo wraparound visual helmet, the action is amazing. The sensations while playing are very strange, a new kind of out-of-body experience almost. Your eyes tell you you're moving, but your body doesn't. Hey, sir, you be me or what? This is it. This is it. I've had enough of this. This is war. It's quite easy to get carried away. This game has real atmosphere. To play this well, you need the reflexes and scanning abilities of a test pilot. Wow, man. That was wicked. Hey, Sav, you're terminated. Terminated. Next, we tried our hands at VPOL, the Harrier flight simulator. You have to put money in. It won't work without money. John. Put it in. Once you put your two pound in and fasten yourself into the eject seat, your jet takes off, launching you into virtual airspace. Gyroscope, John the office Brad is getting a great deal more for his money in G Lock. The fully rotating unit simulates the G forces experienced in flight. Too much pressure can make a pilot loopy. Yeah, he did pretty well. I've got to, I've got to admit it. Yeah, 15 kills. Yeah, 15 kills. That's not kills. bad for a beginner. Oh, here we go. Here he comes. Ah, uh, John, you look, you look really well for me, huh? You very well. Come on, never mind. I'm hungry. Let's go and eat. Yeah, I'll take it. Take it, Carl. How about you, John? Yeah. 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 Hello, this is Tony Dillon. No. Is there a party? Hi, this is Tony, your editor. No, no. Hi, this is Tony. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, this is Tony, and this is the first review. Grand Prix.
Jeff Crammond, author of The Sentinel and Stunt Car Racer, makes a welcome return to our screens with Grand Prix, the latest race simulation from Microprose. You find yourself racing on a number of tracks around the world, the main difference between them being the shape and weather conditions. Although when you drive as badly as this, all you're going to see is spinning tarmac. The controls are quite complex and give you every option imaginable. Whether you need them all is up to your individual expectations. There's an option for a faster race by simply reducing the amount of scenery, though the action is fast enough already. Aren't we supposed to be racing on the track? You can choose from one of six difficulty levels. You can also race against a field of drivers equal to you. Although for all as bad as this, we better take up stock car racing. Grand Prix is a terrific action-packed simulation, well above standard. One thing I would like to clear up now is this. Heimdall is how role-playing games should have been done to begin with. No hexagons, no alphabetic menus, and not a hint of keyboard control. The game is based around the old Nordic legends of Ragnarok, which are far too lengthy to go into here. The general upshot is that you and your party of five have to save the world. Through visiting various lands, searching and pillaging, you are confronted by numerous tasks. These are to find and recover Thor's hammer, Odin's sword and Freya's spear. So choose your party wisely. Your success depends on these people. Everything about this game says enormous. There are an enormous amount of locations and a huge amount of objects to be found and utilized. All fully interactive using a mouse-driven menu system, just like this one. Of course, no warrior worth his salt is going to walk through a strange village without getting into a fight. And in Heimdall, there is more than enough strife for you to sink your sword into. Unlike most role-playing games, all combat is in real time. And if you're not sat at home now saying, wow, I want to know why. The enemies are varied, but all deadly. And if that isn't enough for you, well then why don't you keep your eyes open for the hidden traps? Get Heimdall, <laughs> you'll love it. It's all yours, mate. Okay, Tony, thanks. Um, leave it to me, I, I can do this. Um, everything's under control. <sighs> Hello, viewers. Um, my name's Robert Orbman, and uh, Welcome to my review spot on uh, the, the first edition of Click. Um, so, if you're ready, I'll begin. Shadow Sorcerer is the latest computer game based on the popular role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons. And jolly good it is, too. You and your group of friends, called a party, have to help another group of your friends find a safe place to live, as their previous home has been invaded by monsters. In your way are lots of nasty characters across all different types of terrain. Got that? It's all pretty exciting stuff. I don't mind telling you. You choose your party from a large group of well-disposed heroes. Although I do think it's a little unfair that you can only have four out of the 16 available. But it does all add to the challenge. After all, they don't want to make things too easy, do they? Especially with weapons like these. By the way, please don't try this at home. Even travelling across the fully detailed landscape can be nerve-wracking stuff. You can be attacked at any point you know, so keep your swords sharp. I found Shadow Sorcerer exhilarating and captivating, and the large amounts of options and the detailed strategies will keep you involved for hours. This has been Robert Ordman for Click Magazine. Thank you for watching. Hey, Jason. Yeah? I thought you were going to be coming up with some good tips. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I've got a really good tip as it goes. Go on, then. Yeah. Change your toothpaste. He's in the party, man. Actually, I've come up with a really great tip for Elite. Enter Sarah on the password protection screen. When prompted, enter correct password from the manual and use plus and minus keys on inventory to alter cargo and weapon. Type in your one ugly mother on the title screen for infinite lives. This month, we've got hot tips for Rodlands, Magic Pockets, and the Immortal. And we can give you the entire solution for Ninja 3. Try Click's new hotlines. And here's the last tip from me, Torvac. Type cheat on the high score screen, and while playing, press the fire button and use function keys to skip levels. 
Where's the party? On, Jason, I've changed my top for this one. Move out of the way. Friends, fans, mortals, the time has come for me to present my first review. You see, I'm not just here to educate. I'm here to entertain. Why well, anybody would want to try and improve upon such a classic game is beyond me, but Tri Domark have, and they've done a wonderful job of it. Everything you could want is here, from the classic old level designs to exciting new ones. There isn't a facet of modern game design that hasn't been included in one form or another. There are even bonus screens, where cattle have to be rescued from incoming aliens. One of the best things about the souped up version is that the gameplay is essentially the same. Fast paced action all the way, with the only pauses for breath in between levels, so keep your trigger finger well oiled. Surprisingly enough, despite the title, the key word is variety. With dozens of different alien types and 12 zones for you to get through, you've got your work cut out. But somehow, it doesn't quite seem like work. A vicious gang of thieves have stolen the Fieldington crown jewels and left them, God knows why, in flashing coloured boxes all over town. Finding them is no problem, getting to them is the tricky part. Scotland Yard of High View. Rolling Ronnie, the roller skating errand boy to track them down. There's a lot of ground to cover, but in the time he saves skating about, he can run errands to earn a little cash. The only drawback of the skates is the danger of coming a cropper on rough ground or roadworks. There are loads of bonuses to collect, or some more important than others. Money, for example, has to be grabbed, or else you can't pay for your bus fare at the end of the level. Protect yourself against the endless scream of bad guys by Fran Salami or by using the smart bomb, a power sneeze. I like a game that finds me making excuses to come back for one more try. This is one of the best platform games I've played in a long, long time. Well, unless you've just landed from the planet Mars, in which case, welcome to Earth, you'll all know that the Japanese giants Nintendo are seriously huge. Nintendo's 8-bit NES console is the biggest selling computer of all time. The sales of it and its software in America account for an unbelievably huge chunk of the US national debt. The big news is that its big brother, the 16-bit follow-up, has now arrived in the country, even though Nintendo tried hard to clamp down on these so-called grey imports. So what can it do? Well, for a start, the Famicom boasts loads of software, 4,096 colours and 8-channel stereo sound, so you need another six years to take full advantage. Now, back in the land of the rising chip, you can buy one of these for around £120. And nearly one and a half million people have done just that in the last six months. But despite all that success and a lot of pressure from the public, Nintendo don't want to launch the Famicom in Europe before the end of 1992. Worse still, the imported versions of Famicom have a few disadvantages, the biggest being the price. The average price of a model like this, converted to run on British televisions, will be around £270. So what does all this money get you? Well, you'll get two controllers, the computers, and of course two games, one of which is Super Mario World. I guess we'd have to say, if you can swallow the price, speak Japanese, have lots of time to find the right software, then you may want to pick up a Famicom now. But you're probably better off sitting tight and waiting for the official launch. Oh, Sav, what exactly is an online? Uh, it's like an offline, but with knobs on. I do like a good party. Hey, babe, how's it going? Fine, thank you, John. Dangerous combination. Beauty and brains make a guy like me dizzy. Uh, John, a chocolate milkshake makes you dizzy. Can it, Pipsqueak, can it? I've got a review to do. <laughs> Chocks away, Ginger, as micropros make a departure from their modern combat fight simulators and strap on their goggles and flying jacket. You are one of the British flying aces fighting the terrible Hun over occupied territory. Choose from the dozen planes, taking account of each one's power, speed and capabilities, and then let them have it. 
bombs away. The Tochoi is huge, and the enemy pilots are hard to find and harder to catch. If you take them out, you stand to win some commendations, but you've got to keep your plane up long enough to return to base. Knights of the Sky falls into the fun area of flight simulators. No complicated gadgets to watch, no mess of key controls, just fun aerobatics and combat. The way it's meant to be. Spit and show, old boy. Bravo. The year is irrelevant. A small, peace-loving planet has been attacked by an evil force of fighting monsters. All but two of the people have been wiped out. The two remaining are the sons of the dead king. They are the Mega Twins. In this fairly standard arcade conversion from US Gold, you and a friend play the Mega Twins, racing over land, sea and air, in your quest to free your homeland of the invading hordes. Armed with only your sword and a brave heart, you have to wage your way through infinite waves of attacking enemies. All very cute, but very violent with it. The game takes its cues from every shoot 'em up ever made, with influences ranging from Wonder Boy to R Type. Basically, it's not very original. So, what are the key features? Well, it's quite entertaining. It's like an average arcade game. The two-player mode adds a spark of excitement in places, but that's it. Mega Twins is very average. There's nothing bad about it, but there's so many other games that do the same thing better. What am I doing, Tony? This. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Jim always gets to do the good ones, but still. Interplay have taken us on some strange journeys in the past. We've been through cyberspace in Neuromancer. We've listened to all three of the Bard's tales. And now we enter Middle Earth, land of hobbits, dragons, and the magic rings, as documented by J.R.R. Tolkien. Anyone who has read the book will need no introduction, and anyone who hasn't should. The plot, briefly, is this. Frodo Baggins, a hobbit, and his two closest hobbit friends have to travel across the lands of Middle-earth to destroy a magic ring which ends the power of an evil lord who wishes to take over the world. Got that? Good. The plot follows the book quite closely, with all the same locations and characters, but that doesn't mean that copying the actions of the invented characters will help you complete the tale. Interplay have more than a few twists up their sleeves. Using a simple point-and-click control system, it's as easy to get into the game as it is to load it. However, it will take a while before you really begin to make your way through the adventure. If the size of the game doesn't daunt you, then the humans in it will. Trying to port a story like this into a game format can't be easy, but full marks to interplay for trying. An excellent job and special credit has to go to Charles Deenan of the Maniacs of Noise for the stunning soundtrack. With England having just lost to Australia, Denmark's release of Rugby, the World Cup, is well-timed. The game was designed to play like a dream, look realistic, feature all 16 top international teams, allow up to 16 people to play a knockout and have all the excitement of a contact sport. In fact, everything except make you a cup of tea at half-time. Watching the game, you might be mistaken in thinking that you were watching Anko's kick-off. Well, the game does have many of the same features, but they're all good ones, so that isn't a problem. For example, the game is joystick controlled. The player you represent is the nearest man to the ball, marked with a line, and the controls are simple and easy to get to grips with from the off. The game also has a number of features not common with kickoff. For example, this test of reflexes when attempting a conversion. Whee! <laughs> nice kick! The game is frantic, so it helps to keep a few joysticks spare during play, just in case. It's very addictive, even for a non-sporting person like me. Thankfully, you're not expected to know the rules of rugby inside out to play. In short, this is rugby's answer to kickoff. And although the sport may not be as popular as football, I don't see why the game shouldn't sell enormously. Who cares if England lost when you can rematch against Australia any time with rugby the World Cup?
The best thing about CU Amiga is that it really tells you everything you need to know about your machine. The next best thing is you can use it anywhere. CU Amiga from Emac Images. Hi Game Freaks, I'm here to tell you about the only magazine that covers all the action, CMVG. Now with a free handheld mag and all for 140. That's right, the very first to cover handheld. You gotta have it, I gotta have it, we all gotta have it. CMVG from Memap Images. In 1979, a strange phenomenon shook the world. Now they're back with a vengeance. Bigger, badder, brighter, bolder and better, Super Space Invaders sends the game that launched a thousand games rocketing into the 21st century with a host of amazing features. Level after level of increasingly weird and hostile invaders. Super Space Invaders. It's the sequel with no equal. Most computer games magazines are designed for dedicated players. Ace is designed for dedicated winners. Ace from EMAP Images. Don't miss next month's click. This is Tech House, home of Tech London Limited, one of the country's leading developing houses. At the moment, they're working on a new revolutionary role-playing game for Denmark called Shadowlands. Now, I don't know if you've heard the hype, but I have, and I think it sounds great. I think we should go take a look at it. Now, being a development house, of course, they're working on some other stuff as well. Oh, well, that's interesting, which we're not allowed to take a look at. But I know there's some stuff in here. Now, I think this could be quite interesting. Now, let's keep this quiet. No, sorry, out. Oh, well, that didn't work. Still, maybe there's somebody upstairs we can talk to about Shadowlands. Follow me. Ah, Dean Lester, how are you? Hi, Tony. Nice to see you. Now, Dean, tell me, what is Shadowlands? Well, Shadowlands is a role-playing game along the lines of the kind of game that we always wanted to play ourselves. Uh, but nobody else had written the game, so we decided that we were going to write it. The game itself is very arcade-orientated, but features um, all the features that I think any role-playing game aficionado would want to see. And um, The game itself takes place over several different worlds. There's the dungeons and the temple, Egyptian levels. Uh, and there are outside locations with day and night cycles as well. Um, it features quite a few innovative new features that people won't have seen before. For example, it's an isometric game that scrolls, and in addition to that, obviously, it's got Photoscape in it as well. So, Barry, what is Photoscape? Photoscape is a new uh, revolutionary lighting system which uh, allows you to have objects in the game which are in shadow or in light, and depending on what, the, what they are in, they get seen differently. 
Uh, for example, on this screen here, you can see these objects are all silhouetted and in black. But near where the torch is, these objects can be seen clearly and are in colour. At the moment, I'm in the uh, level editor. This lets me put objects around in different places on the screen and define relationships between objects, like what switches do, and so on. So, Mark, what kind of approach are you taking on the graphics? OK, well, many as you can see here, the approach I've taken is a Japanese approach to graphics, mainly because it hasn't been done before in a European role-playing game. Uh, main graphics have been, as you tell, uh, Dungeon Master, Eye the Beholder, they've all been European stars. As you can see by the graphics here, the uh, armour on the Minotaur, we've gone for the Japanese samurai armour approach. Right, now there are a lot of people that would like to be doing the job you're doing. So, I mean, have you got any hints for anyone out there that would love to get into like professional graphic design? Well, basically, um, main approach is go for what I did. Get a few demo discs together, get a good portfolio together, just basic pencils, pencil sketches, and basically go around hassling as many programming houses as possible until you get the right job you want. Now you've seen how the top games take shape, how would you like to be a part of it? Send us a demo disc with your best work, graphics, coding or sound, and we'll pass the best 20 on to tech. The best three win a brand new Commodore CDTV. And there are 50 exclusive click t-shirts for runners up. So get your entry in by December 31st. The ninja were the most feared warriors of their day. Known as the Mystic Shadow Warriors, they were the elite fighting force of 9th century feudal Japan. You are Amakuni, the last ninja, in his seemingly endless battle against Kunitaki. If it's a beat-em-up you're after, Last Ninja 3 offers more than you could ask for. It's a strong depth of play, and mastering the tricky joystick controls that command the kicks, punches and somersaults of your agile fighting machine gets you further into the game each time you play. Because of the adventure element of the game, it helps to make a map as you work your way past a large variety of obstacles and enemies. It will help you to avoid getting lost. It's hard to keep your sense of direction when your opponents just keep coming after you. These guys are tough, but remember, you can be tougher. And if things get too hot, you can always take the easy way out. Ninja 3, bleeping brilliant. In exile from Audiogenic, you're a fearless pilot flying home for a well-earned rest after a dangerous mission when you hear a distress call from a group of colonists on a nearby planet. They've discovered the presence of Triax, a nasty character sent into exile due to a severe case of scientific malpractice. They have been captured and are being held as guinea pigs for his work. Now it's up to you to get to him before he gets to them. Exile is an action adventure with several puzzles to solve along the way. It takes place beneath the surface of the planet in a massive network of catacombs and caves. The only equipment you have is what you can find on the planet, as you lost all yours on your last mission. The controls are quite complex at first. The keyboard operation doesn't seem to leave any key untouched, though I'm sure that's just my imagination. Remember, you're dealing with little gravity, meteor storms, and a jetpack which takes some getting used to, as you can see. This is a very playable game, and one that I could happily spend all my spare time playing. All the elements of the game combine to make it intriguing and addictive. That's what makes it well worth buying. The Magnetic Scrolls Collection is a compilation of three great old adventure games. Fish, Corruption and Guild of Thieves. What sets these apart from any other adventure games is the introduction of Magnetic Windows, Virgin's stunning new control system. On screen, you can pull up a number of menus and options that give you instant access to the commands you'll be using in the game. You can also pull up a series of accessory windows, including a map that draws itself, a still graphics screen, a compass which you can click on to move from location to location, and a visual inventory. There are sub-menus too that contain numerous verbs and commands, such as examine or open, that you use often. You can even change your font. Fish is my personal favourite, it's got a wicked sense of humour. Fish, Corruption and Guild of Thieves were always great adventures, but with magnetic windows they are now brilliant adventures.
The Lotus has a reputation for being a status symbol, as well as being one of the fastest cars on the road today. In Lotus 2, you get a chance to race one of these beauties. As you charge along at speeds of up to 150 mile an hour, the computer throws everything at you to slow you down or stop you, losing valuable time. On level one, we have logs, rivers and rocks, all carefully placed to stop you beating that clock. From level two, things really start to get difficult. Night driving courses take your reflexes to the limit as cars and bends in the road leap out of nowhere. And watch out for the tunnel walls. You can choose to play against a friend or up to three friends if you link your machines. And the password system means you can continue your game on any level you like. No matter what the weather, Lotus 2 holds the road perfectly. At last, a really good race game. Don't forget, you can buy any game reviewed in this issue of Click for five pounds off the retail price, simply by completing the enclosed voucher and mailing it to us. No fuss, no muss, no poster packing. Just five pounds off the retail price and the game at your door within 14 days. Sorry, only one game per person this time. And get your voucher in before click number two hits the stands. That's December 27th. Isn't it about time I review my games then? Well, what have you been working on this month? Uh, Captain Planet and Robocod. Fine, get on with it. Captain Planet and Robocod it is then. <laughs> There's a cartoon on Saturday mornings called Captain Planet. It's one of those Japanese things with superheroes joining forces to save the Earth. Gripping stuff. Episode 7. Superman recycles a newspaper. That sort of thing. This is Mindscape's conversion of that series, and I found it boring. There are five levels to the game, one for each character. This is Fire's level. His mission is to free some seals who are trapped in clouds above the ozone layer and won't walk across until it has been repaired. I may not know much, but I know that seals do not look like this. Polar bears, maybe, or is he some kind of mutant? Captain Planet doesn't fit into any category. There isn't enough action to say this is a great action game. There isn't enough strategy to call this an adventure. And it doesn't make it as an arcade game either. I found the controls too slow and the sprite collision system dopey. The game is basically unplayable. It could have been good, but it isn't. Santa Claus has been kidnapped and hidden at the top of a great tower. Your task as Robocod, the bionic aquatic hero, is to find him and set him free. The tower is split into dozens of huge rooms, and all with weird and wonderful backdrops and enemies. You get some great bonuses on later levels, like this plane with a scarf to keep out the cold. Watch out though, the skies can be crowded. Jumping and stretching around the levels, Robo's only protection is his heavy armoured fins, and his only means of attack is his weight problem. Like all good arcade games, there are little elements of strategy. Like here, how's this for using your head? The design of the game is terrific. There are intricate mazes, hidden rooms, well-placed enemies, dirt knots. Robocod is really exciting. It has great sound and pictures and brilliant joystick control that makes it a lot of fun to play. We're pretty sure it'll become a classic, even with the teddy bear. Amos is a name that is probably familiar to most of you. It surprised the world when it was one of the best-selling products of last year. Why? 
<laughs> well, who would have thought a programming language could be such a biggie? For that's all Amos is. A hybrid of BASIC designed specifically to harness the Amiga's processing power for games development. And it has sold so well because, as you can see, Amos is very fast. And everything we are showing you here has been written in uncompiled BASIC. This car racing demo, for example, has been written using a new Amos extension, simply called Amos 3D. There are other extension disks available. You can get them through PD. I mean, including software like this sprite designer. Catchy logo, huh? For anyone who thought 3D construction kit from Incentive was good, watch this. Impressed? We sure were. And to think all you need to write something like this is a little patience and a basic understanding of geometry. Not much to ask for results like these, I'm sure you'll agree. It took a genius to write, Amos, but you don't have to be one to use it. Be sure you get click number two. How do you spell nothing? N U double F I N K. Thanks. Who's having a party? What are you doing, Sam? Do my review on the PC. What, you? Yeah. Well, this ain't a foreign language version, is it? We'll have to use subtitles. You got a problem? Sav, look, I should be doing this. Because I've got presents and poise. And more than anything else, Sav, brain power, which you ain't got. Two more brain cells, Jake. You might make it to pond life. So just go away and let me get on with it. Jolly good. Are we going to a party? Spell that wrong. Before I got this job, I used to work in a proper office. Good opening line. You know, with a salary, coffee break, and lunch breaks, and going home at night. Yes, well, anyway, it was boring. And why? Because no games in the office. Hmm, yeah. We had PCs all right, but it's hard to play a good game on a project management flowchart. You can get a card for a hundred quid that will turn your boring green and purple screen into Hollywood. Up to a quarter of a million colours, they say, but I haven't finished counting them yet. Another 90 quid gets you a sound card that makes your PC games come alive. It's called Adlib. And it gives the PC eight channels of stereo sound and speech even clearer than mine. It's a bit rough. Thing is, it all costs lots of dosh. For example, Emshed have just come out with a games PC with all the mod cons. But you're talking over a grand. So it's not much cop unless you get your employer to pay for it. I like that. But there's a new CD-ROM unit out from Philips for less than 600 pounds, which can turn a well-equipped PC into a seriously mean machine and it's about the best possible option for a rich and idle. That's good. On the soft side, arcade games are coming out thick and fast, and more and more software publishers are including PC conversions as part of their standard development lists. Excellent. Office life is looking much better with all this new gear for the PC. It might even be worth considering going back to a proper job. I don't think I will. I think I'll stay here. It's easy life. Easy money. Now I'll finish up and go home. As the sales blurb says, the MiG-29 will one day become the definitive fighter. We've seen one MiG simulation before, and now Domark are having another try. Somewhere in South America, a military coup has taken place, leaving 20,000 square miles under rebel control. Your mission is to destroy strategic installations and take the headquarters. Basically, you need to put in a great deal of flying time to be rewarded with very little action. And the controls are pretty laborious, even for a flight simulator. I can't help wondering whether it's worth all this work just to get this simulated kite off the ground. Silent Service 2 is finally here after six long years as big and as bad as everyone expected it to be. It's 
It's one of those classic games that should just be for the fans of the genre. But for some reason, everyone just loves it. As a commander of a nuclear-powered submarine, your aim, as is common with micro simulations, is to lead the Allies to victory through a series of ever-progressing missions while ascending the ranks of power. You have full control over the submarine you choose to head, from navigation commands to full attack and evasive maneuvers. And to make things a little easier, you can select high-powered subs, tipping the balance in your favor. Combat is about 80% strategic, which makes sense given the response time of your average submarine. There are timing elements, but for the most part, you'll be plotting your target and waiting, and that's the way it should be. Silent Service 2 should strike a chord in the hearts of fans of the original, and it will interest others. It is an incredible simulation, with enough depth to involve you for months. This game is well recommended, especially if you like your action deep. Golf games have always had a strange attraction in the eyes of Joe Public. Not surprisingly, Micropros, the masters of the simulation world, have come up with their own offering. And wow, is it good! There's a fairly high level of intricacy involved when playing golf, with things like wind speed and the lay of the land to take into account. Keen to prove that this is a simulation, not a simplified game, authors The Thought Train have given you over 20 options to play around the greens and fairways, allowing you to play left or right-handed, change the way you stand, and even choose the type of tee you use. Playing Microprose Golf is simple once you learn all the options. You use the unique map mode to determine your direction and the distance of your shot, and then switching to this action screen, where carefully timed presses of the mouse button set the accuracy of your swing. Nice shot. It's a very friendly system, but it's the learning process. You know, selecting the right club, putting just enough slice on a ball to guide it through a crosswind, even choosing the camera style that suits you best, that makes it so addictive. It's a real case of easy to play, hard to play well. And it's this progressive curve that ensures golf will stay on your screen for a very long time indeed. You may miss the odd shot, but you don't want to miss this game. With the recent spate of cutesy console-type games, it's sometimes a little difficult to get rid of the aggression working on this magazine can generate. After selecting one of these ten bruisers, each with his own style and haircut, Final Blow lets you throw the sort of punches Tyson could only dream of. There are two basic game styles. You can play as part of a knockout tournament where the winner stays on, or you can take a place in the boxing league as part of a field of ten where you keep on punching regardless. You can see how well presented it is. And let me tell you that the simple but effective joystick control system easily matches it. Final blow is the final word in boxing simulations. A knockout by all accounts. Look, I can't get the hang of this. You do it. Do it. Hey, I'm on crutches. Oh, sorry, boys, we're doing anything. John, darling, come and talk to me when you've started shaving. Check. Checkmate. Never mind, we'll do double or quits on Lotus too. Well, it's a good show. Would have been a lot better with a lot more me in it. Well, that's the beauty of being an editor. You can make decisions like that. It's not even a punchline, really. Yes, there is. It's your tea. Party time. Another late night of the headbanging bull, Tony. No, no, I, I had an early night. I didn't get to the gig. The old sailor had long sold out by the time I got there. So? Oh, just this cover disc. It's like watching paint dry. Mm. Was this about a party? Once upon a time... <laughs> Once upon a time, magazines had something called a cover story. Now, it's called a cover mount story. We thought it might be worth taking an objective look at this body. We thought it might be worth taking an objective look at this whole area. 
So I got the job of buying a load of last month's computer mags. <laughs> Go, Thanks, sir. And there were so many freebies, I had to get... Oh! Okay. So I got the job of buying a load of last month's computer go, mags. Thanks, sir. And there were so many freebies on them that I had to get Sav to keep... <laughs> Can we do this next month, please? Click 2 at your newsstand December 27th. We want you to really enjoy Click, so write in with your harebrained schemes and we'll see what we can do. Next time, you could be a guest reviewer.